May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This week I saw someone wearing a t-shirt that said, I am a teacher during COVID-19. What's your superpower? I loved it, so true. And we are all the more in awe during this sort of back to school season. The the t-shirt made me think of all those, frankly, acting on behalf of others in these times. So what is your superpower? Isn't there one you dreamt of having as a child? Perhaps we do have them and don't see them that way, or worse, don't use them that way. Well, today we see a child's mother muster her superpower as she barges in on Jesus having a poorly hidden break to seek healing for her child. She has heard of the man and his healing power, his teachings even. And though she's definitely an outsider to his community, she charges in anyway, dropping to her knees with humility and hope. She begs Jesus for help. Well, her plea is not only denied, she's insulted. Did he just call my daughter and I dogs? Not worth feeding? How would you respond? Fine, be a sectarian bigot. Go feed your insider favorites if they're the only ones you care about. Okay, that would be on the tip of my tongue. Maybe no one else's. But this gutsy, determined woman does none of those things and shows no hint of any humiliation or seeking of retribution. Instead, she speaks a profound truth. Yes, she says, but Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She speaks this truth without personal defensiveness, rancor, even reproach at his slight to her. There is also this wonderful twist in their exchange that's unfortunately hidden in the linguistics of the Greek in Mark's gospel. When Jesus speaks of the children who are to be fed first, those children whose food should not be thrown to the dogs, the word used for child here is technon, which means a child who's a true descendant regarded as an inhabitant, children begotten by virtue of the divine promise, that is to say, Israel, heirs to be fed first. Now, her response to him, to this allusion to Israel being more deserving than the Gentiles like her, is so wise and so well considered that I always picture this unnamed woman as a young RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So she does not use that bias-bearing word for children. Instead, she uses pahidion, which is to say any little child or infant, a youngster still under training, learning. And so, The term she uses points to all created children. Yes, she is schooling him, and he gets it. Her superpower is revealed. I want you to think about the last time you tried to change someone's mind about something important and were painfully rebuffed. Or maybe you didn't try because you were afraid of being rebuffed. That slap back retort on the tip of our tongue or Facebook fingers might briefly satisfy a hunger for vengeance, but it is her responding from alongside Jesus, not doing this, but doing this, that turns his heart to heal her daughter, 
helps him see something quite new. Her daughter is her paramount concern. Wellness is the mission. Not her ego or being shamed or any concern for how she appears to him or others. She would not be deterred and used her God-given gifts for fierce advocacy. Courage, intelligence, boldness, great love. She brings these to bear. Advocating for someone she loved, she offered this famed and favored foreign she had this famed and favored Jewish healer, a way to assimilate what she was saying, this request from a foreign Gentile outsider, a way that opened an opportune door but didn't try to shove him through it. She would be heard by this Jesus who could heal. It is no accident that Mark places this story right before and alongside Jesus healing of a man who is both deaf and unable to speak. Yes, Jesus does hear her, perhaps hearing something more powerful than he expected, and he says so. If we let the nuance of the Greek come through again, his answer we hear is, because of this word of yours, go, the demon has left your daughter. Because of this logos is what's used in this sentence. Logos. It indicates a word embodying an idea, a divine utterance. And when capitalized, we hear it as God's word, as the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It dwells among us and in us, in her. When we speak from this logos of God, we are heard differently. When it is spoken to us, we hear the truth in it. There is divine courage and purpose imbued every time I've encountered it. And that's not to say it always prevails. Not at all. Only that such faithfulness in action and words are actions in a way, such faithfulness is not carried out alone or in vain. We hear this immediately afterwards when, like the woman acting on behalf of her daughter, people in the next town Jesus visits act on behalf of a man who could not speak or hear. They take him to Jesus and beg him, lay hands on their friend's friend and heal him. Be opened, Jesus prays with a sigh. And his tongue was loosed and his ears opened to hear. Be opened, the prayer is for us too. Listen to those we might unconsciously assume are outsiders to our inside. Listen and speak truth even when it seems we are being called dogs. In the letter of James, you just heard Dan read so powerfully. He challenges us to do just that. Can we see brothers and sisters who are naked or hungry? What good does it do to send them in peace, urging them to keep warm and safe and eat their fill if we fail to see and hear and help their needs? Insiders? Outsiders? We need only to erect a wall or a border to create insiders and outsiders. Without it, there aren't any. Does the world see dogs or children? We know many people from Afghanistan who have worked with our military are now in grave danger along with their families. As they come here seeking safety, how will they be seen? Who will we see? What will they need to live and thrive? And how will we help? As this has been running through my mind for days, I discovered an odd association occurring through this reading. 
And I invite you to engage in a little bit of a stretch and see if this speaks to you too. Mark's gospel refers to being allowed to eat the crumbs under the table, those outsider Gentiles. And I learned the word for crumbs here is a diminutive form of the word for psalm, psalo. It can mean a morsel or a crumb. It also can mean a bit of music, to sing a hymn, to praise God in song. In Paul's letters, the word is translated, I will sing. The Taliban has now banned music in Afghanistan. Students have fled the music schools and with other musicians are burning, hiding, abandoning, destroying their beloved instruments. How would you hunger for music if it were banned? How would that feel to us who just sang our way into worship? If it were banned, instruments and all, that might be just a crumb to some, yet others would sooner forego shelter and food. Music is so vital. It is a love intrinsic to people the whole world over and no boundary, no authority can shut it out completely. The needs of those who are coming will be basics and essentials, yes, and I pray, I know, we can help with those, and we will. They will also have intangible but equally critical needs like music, friendship, mentoring, laughing, weeping, listening to each other's truth, hearing it, seeing each other, and being seen as children of one God. Heal my child, the foreign woman pled. Lay hands on our friend, they asked. Be opened, Jesus prayed. And God gave us gifts, superpowers, that we might embody the word. And in advocating for another, we can find strengths engaged in a far higher purpose. Amen. Oh,